It's November. Your third grade teacher has assigned an art project in preparation for the holidays. Hold up your non-dominant hand. Go ahead, do it. I'm a teacher. I can wait. <laughs> Plunk it down on your construction paper and trace its outline with your chunky pencil. How many turkeys did you make using your hand as a template? When you were finished coloring in your turkey, did you then attach feathers to a strip of brown paper bag and make a headdress? If so, you may have been crafting the war bonnet of the Great Plains Cheyenne. The Great Plains are over a thousand miles west of Provincetown, where you sit today and where the pilgrims first came ashore. But don't tell an eight-year-old that. As a young child, I loved bringing home these arts and crafts. As a teacher and researcher today, I find this type of instruction problematic on multiple levels. The foundational story of colonization taught around the United States too often memorializes and mythologizes an initial alliance between the Wampanoag, the first people of this land, and a struggling band of English emigrants who arrive in 1620. Too frequently in our classrooms, we stop the story short of later incidents, times of struggle and resistance and survival for indigenous nations around our country today. But every time we stop the story short, avoiding survival and resistance, every time we stop that story short, we reinforce structures that marginalize indigenous voices, leading to this self-perpetuating cycle that strips power and identity from the colonized. And we lose half the narrative when the first peoples of this land are erased. Our students deserve more than an easy mythology. They benefit in countless ways when we ask them to wrestle with not just this, but all difficult history. Today, I want to talk about a different path for our schools, a path where we can confront the past. I want to talk about how difficult history can be used to engage the next generation of thinkers and engaged citizens. So what is it, this idea of difficult history? Events in the past that contradict our understanding of who we are and the values we now hold, both as individuals and as a nation, can be considered difficult history. It's not hard to think of examples, times when humanity has taken a dark turn. Slavery, the Holocaust. We agree that these historical events should be learned in part so atrocities are not repeated. And so we ask students very often to wrestle with this history in our schools. But what happens when survival and resistance are part of a foundational story, the story of the birth of a nation, of who we are as a country? How do we teach that history when it is so damaging to indigenous nations across the country? Where do we put that difficult history in our curricula? I decided to jet off to New Zealand to find out. With a similar colonial past to my home here in New England, New Zealand seemed like the perfect place to examine the role of difficult history in schools. I wondered if teachers in other parts of the colonized world were teaching indigenous narratives, and if not, why not? Once I landed at Victoria University in Wellington, New Zealand, with a Fulbright Distinguished Award in Teaching, I had three months to figure it out. But first, why did I need to leave the country to look for answers? At home, I will always be a colonizer. I have a nearly 400-year ancestry, which seems like a good amount of time until you realize the Wampanoag have lived here for over 12,000 years. This spit of land, these scrub pines, an ocean of flounder, the home of the Wampanoag, which means the people of the first light. I have a handful of arrowheads passed down to me from my uncle and a few dug from my childhood backyard. 
I have a shelf of teaching resources related to Native Americans of the Northeast. I have a deep attachment to and respect for this place where I grew up, but I also realize that I wasn't here first. Everything that is beautiful here was well-loved before I arrived, and now I needed to leave to understand this better. So I went to New Zealand to look for insights and new perspectives. In a country whose stated goal is biculturalism, where I rose at dawn to hear Maori elders sing karakia, a blessing, as the sun rose over Matthew Soames Island, which is their ancestral land, but also the first landing place for settler ships from England. In a place like this, how was history being used to create balance between Maori and non-Maori? How were teachers supporting the parallel stories of two cultures moving together through time? What I found was a lack of historical literacy among all ethnicities. While New Zealand is firmly committed to honoring all cultures, teachers reported that very often in their schools, there was a lack of historical literacy among all of their kids. When the Ministry of Education sets standards for cultural competencies, current day ways of knowing are often put into a school's curriculum. Kapahaka groups meet before school to practice their ceremonial dance routines. Te Reo Maori, the language of the Maori, is often included in a school's mission statement. While New Zealand school leaders and educators are firmly committed to recognizing and honoring the past, they also believe that stories of survival and resistance can serve to divide people today. And so often, they encourage current day ways of knowing, current day concepts of kindness and empathy moving forward. But I believe that this is not enough, so here we are. In the US, we talk about our nation's past in our schools, but we're leaving out major parts of the story and sanitizing and mythologizing the harder truths of colonization. New Zealand's model focuses on the future, emphasizing kindness and partnership moving forward. Where shall we put our difficult past? And is there room to revise these foundational stories? Is this necessary? What's wrong with just focusing on a kinder future? Let's begin by recognizing that we all carry parts of the past along with us. Just as I sift through my uncle's arrowheads, we are built from our stories. We understand the story of ourselves in this nation when we learn our history in schools, starting as early as those turkeys and inaccurate headdresses. I ask you, can misrepresentation ever build a solid foundation for knowledge? Lessons that go on to mythologize and sanitize this victorious colonization often lead to stereotyping, and erasure for indigenous communities today. Working with our difficult history, there's room for all of us to grow. First, we need to question false and incomplete narratives about the past so that indigenous communities can continue to add their voices to the story. It is important for this work to happen in colonized countries like the US and New Zealand, where old ways of thinking continue to strip power and identity from the colonized indigenous peoples today. When all young people see themselves in the narrative, when their stories, traditions, and ways of knowing are honored, we are all stronger for this sharing. As teachers, we need to challenge our students to break down stereotypes and bust through tired mythologies. The 2020 commemoration of the landing of the pilgrims in this area gives us an opportunity to engage in some powerful work here. We need to challenge students in lessons designed to make them feel just a little uncomfortable. Why do you believe all Native people wore headdresses? What is the Treaty of Mutual Protection supposed to mean? 
We need students to reach into that place of deeper empathy born of understanding multiple sides of a story. I'll let my students take the lead here. I'd like to share two poems that are the capstone of a unit on, based on research writing and poetry, but the poems really show the depth of my students' understanding um, and how deeply a 12-year-old can think if you ask them to. When my student Brendan writes in his Ode to Metacom, who is a Wampanoag Sachem, a leader of his people, when Brendan writes, I hear an animal that missteps behind me and crack. I turn around as slow as a fish on land, but what I hear has vanished. You see, I'm too distracted and scared these days. My brother was poisoned by the English, and a war is brewing because of the poisoning. Also, because the English think we should follow their laws and they should rule us. I know from Brendan's writing that he understands the inner conflicts of Metacom when he is dealing with the English, that the relationship between the Wampanoag and English is difficult for Metacom at this time. My student is showing deep understanding. He has broken through a tired mythology. When my student Scarlet writes, as my cold, wet feet touch the sandy bottom of the Taunton River, I open my eyes one last time, hoping to be back in my village. But all I see is the dark, cloudy water. I have run out of air. I have run out of time. And I have run out of memories. I know that Scarlet understands what Weedamu, a Wampanoag sachem, is giving up when she leads her people to resist the English during King Philip's war, that Weedamu is giving up her life for her beliefs. Scarlet has reached into that place of deeper empathy. She is taking the courage and the bravery of this moment and pouring it into her writing, making her not only a better writer and a more knowledgeable historian, but more importantly, a better person. We are miles away from a turkey outline now. Finally, as teachers, we need to embrace the opportunities we create when we revisit all forms of difficult history in our schools. Within the walls of our schools, within our classrooms, we are working to create safe spaces for disagreement places where the structures for respectful but rigorous debate are taught and upheld. Here, we can examine multiple complexities and perspectives as we unpack stories shaping citizenship and our country today, stories of inequality and deception, stories of survival and resistance. Never underestimate what our youngest citizens will show you when they are pushed to wrestle with inconsistencies in what they think they believe. Tackling tough issues, balancing perspectives, listening. Every time we engage students in these processes, not only are we wearing away at the cycle of colonization perpetuated by old narratives, but we are shaping the next generation of thinkers and engaged citizens. In the end, it is future generations that will continue to write our story. So let's work together to help them to write it better. I'd like to leave you with a karakia, a blessing in the Maori tradition. It will be only part of a karakia in the Maori tradition. Blessing our time together. Kui e, taiki e, we come together we are woven as one. Ki ora and thank you very much.